because you're jumping back into the gut. Oh, let's hey, go. Coach. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. I appreciate you joining us for this week's podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit basketballimmersion.com for more coaching resources and access to all the basketball podcasts. I hope you will give us a shout out on social media, on Twitter at Bball Immersion, or on Instagram at Basketball Immersion to help me continue to share the game. Enjoy the episode. Coaches, this one's a real treat today. Excited to have Joe Boylan with us. Is a he, basketball coach with 11 years experience in professional basketball. He has worked in player development for the Golden State Warriors, Memphis Grizzlies, and New Orleans Pelicans. He specializes in practice design, effective learning strategies, and mental skills, and uh, is someone who I'm super excited to get to know a little bit more. And uh, we've got to know each other a little bit over the last uh, month or so, Coach, but uh, great to have you on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Super excited. I'm a huge, huge fan. And so this is a, this is a really cool, cool thing for me. Well, when we finally connected, uh, we found out we have a, a lot of uh, similar interests. And uh, I'd love to get a little bit of your background then, especially with your NBA experience in terms of some of these areas, practice design, practice design effective learning strategies, mental skills. Can you talk a little bit of how your background meshed these in terms of your basketball and then some of these evidence-based ideas? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time going back and forth, working with the development league and the NBA team and, and a few of the stops that I've been to. And so uh, in, in that experience, I've kind of found how to connect different parts, different domains, because it was just a necessity. You know, we didn't have a lot of the resources in terms of um, just coaches, strength and conditioning coaches, the resources were a little bit more limited. And so I kind of started to try and take on a little bit of the return to play protocol, kind of trying to mesh the strength conditioning and the physical therapy with the basketball. So as soon as players were able to get back on the court, I tried to be involved in that as a coach. And so that's kind of what started to spark my interest in, okay, it doesn't make sense to me that these players, as the coaches, we don't touch these guys until they're fully cleared for practice. And I thought, you know, I, I want to get involved with these guys as soon as they're cleared for activity and try and find a way to make it basketball related. Um, and so through doing that uh, down in Des Moines, Iowa, with the Iowa Energy at the time and um, working into the Grand Rapids Drive and worked with some really good coaches that gave me freedom to do it. Then when I went to Memphis uh, working for the Grizzlies, I met two sports scientists, um, two Australian guys named uh, Dean Little and Dave Taylor. And these guys were just so brilliant and had such an interesting and unique perspective. They were outside of the sport and they had come in and they just had all these very simple, but just thought provoking questions about the way that I was working players out, the way everyone was working players out. I just happened to ask them for feedback, I think, more than more than others. And so I would I would ask them to audit my workouts as I was working players out. Just give me feedback from your perspective somebody that's not really has specific basketball background or specifically worked in the NBA. And they just really started to make me think about what I was doing from both a physical standpoint, but also what was the cognitive load that I was putting on guys. And so they just made me like consider what I was doing. And, you know, I showed up a lot at the time and said, I'm going to get this guy better. I'm going to use the drills and the, you know, the structure that I have always used. And, you know, that's a dangerous, that's a dangerous expression. And they really forced me to challenge that and to really dive into having more intelligent design with the practice plan and, you know, having, being mindful of the exposure of what I was exposing the players to during the workout, what was the objective of the workout and was my design accomplishing, you know, what the objectives were. So those two guys were super impactful and changing kind of the way that I thought about practice design and learning strategies and, and also just my own, my own personal development as well. So those are the, those are the big, big changing moments that made me think I, this is something really that interests me that I, I need to get better at and learn more about. It's awesome to hear. And particularly the part about the mental load that you put on players. And sometimes we don't consider that as much as the physical load. So can you give us an example of what you mean by overtaxing them maybe with a mental load? Um, 
Well, I don't overtaxing. I, I, I don't know if that's the, the term I'd use. I just think that the, there's a sliding scale of what we're asking to play. In a game, there's, there's very rarely the opportunity to check out mentally, as we know. Every moment matters. And so I just want to oftentimes recreate the fact that your mind is going to be, I guess, overloaded. There's going to be a lot of things on your mind you're going to have to deal with in a game. So to disassociate those things in practice, that to me didn't add up. And I just think there's like when you're when you're just shooting, OK, make let's make 10 from the spot. We know that that's a very light cognitive load. Between one and ten, you can think about just about anything. Things, the situation isn't changing at all. So you shoot that first rep, and then it's really shooting the second rep a bunch of different times over and over again because you've already you, you've started into block practice. And so those that's you know some players are going to want that. They're going to be burnt out. You know maybe you get them at the end of a practice or the end of a day, and that's that's all they have the capacity for. Um, what we found is that by adding even in that, adding some type of uh, cognitive load, like, okay, we're going to only only makes that count or ones that hit the back rim and go in. And so now at least there's a target on every single rep that makes it a little bit different. Um, it, you know, and that's if you wanted to, if you wanted to keep the same physical load, but then adding in constraints in general, make you as a player have to consider it like, okay, now we're going to work on your ball handling and this one-on-one the only move you can use is the behind the back. Now, and when it happens, you see these guys get a little bit frustrated because they go into the between the legs naturally, and it's, oh, yeah, this constraint has been put on me. I have to utilize this certain skill that I'm trying to kind of incubate. And so, and then those are minor examples. Those are more of the, you know, but I think just in general, any type of constraint, any type of rule, any type of, you know, you, you can only score on your second touch here. You can only score after you, uh, the ball touches the paint. If you drive the ball into the paint and pick it out, only then are you able to score. You can't score, you know, you can only score on assisted baskets. There's, I think you can come up with, you know, hundreds of different constraints that now all of a sudden you're not just out there playing quote unquote freely. There's something else you have to consider while you're executing the skill. And you can make that as complex and, you know, as difficult as you want. Like I said, on the sliding scale of how, much you want to tax this person because you, you know as you notice if especially if you do rpe reported perceived exertion if you ask guys how they feel after workouts where there is no cognitive load versus there being cognitive load um i think you're, you'll get different answers and i think you also get a different level of engagement as well those are tremendous examples that's that's exactly what i was trying to get to and uh i'm so excited to dive deeper with some of these Let's let's talk about the first thing, which is you mentioned it real early on, which is this concept of you don't have many times in a game to drop concentration. But as coaches, we should be teaching them when they are allowed to drop concentration. And I'm imagining that's something that's come through with the work you've done with sports psychologists is that we focus so much on teaching them how to concentrate and how to focus. But really, the main part of teaching them how to focus, in my opinion, is teaching them when they don't have to let's say on the first free throw, right? There's different times in a game where you really can simply drop concentration. Is that something that you've got into a little bit with players in terms of helping them to understand? Yes, absolutely. Like you said, the, I work with a great sports psychologist in New Orleans named Jenna Rosen, who uh, once COVID hit, we did a lot of, of mental skills training with guys. And I think you're spot on. I think you can train these things. You can link these things to events in the game. I mean, with some of the guys, we said every time a whistle, every time you hear a whistle, take a deep breath. And, and, you know, when you come out of the game, what's your game plan for, you know, getting your heart rate down, processing what just happened and refocusing on what's going to come next. You know, those giving them those little micro strategies within the game of, and it's like habit stacking, you know, it works for me. I, something I know I'm going to do every day. If I want to add a habit, I, okay. When I, you know, when I get done meditating, I'm going to add this because this is something I know is going to happen every day. Okay. In a game, you know, the whistle is going to blow, you know, you're going to probably be upset at some of the ways that the referees call the game. Can we work on our emotional control every time we hear a whistle by prompting a deep breath 
and just a, a refocusing and a calming of the fact that let's control what we can control. And I mean, yeah, understanding your free throw routine, understanding the breaks of the game and, and linking just skills, equipping them with little tools, I think is, um, has been, has been something that we've definitely worked on with guys and tried to find ways to, to stay present. Right? Because I think that is a, that is a huge advantage once the game's going on. We've all done it as coaches, you know, we've all, you know, got on players to say, concentrate, you got to concentrate, you know, and those different things that go with that. But I, I just love that you're connecting it with, with the realities of what that means for a player, which again, when do you not have to concentrate or to remind them about their routines or their thought stopping or the, you know, whatever you have in place to be able to help them concentrate. And that's right. really what we should be doing. Right. And I think to that point, you have this next play mentality, which is a big buzzword. I've heard every coach say, move on to the next play. And it sounds good. And I, I, I love it. I want it. I want that to happen. But just like anything else, saying things as a coach without practicing them is a little bit empty. You can tell players to do, yeah, you can yell at them and tell them don't turn the ball over, but it's your job to tell them what they're doing that's producing these turnovers. It's your job to create the structure that helps limit those turnovers. You have to give them solutions, not just identify the problem. And so when guys are frustrated and do have this reaction or do not move on to the next play, well, that has to be re rehearsed. You have to have to have an opportunity to do it in a low stakes environment to fail at it. You have to have the opportunity to lose your cool and recognize it because learning is done through experience. You can tell a player that, but it's they have to they have to feel themselves lose control and then recognize it. it has to be brought to their attention. Hey, look, this is what's happening. And so that's that was another part of our practice design was trying to push those buttons. You know, we would play. We played a lot of competitive games um, this past year, but over the past couple of years, really since I started working with these sports scientists, where I said, I, this is something that is every player can in, would benefit from improving in this and no one else is working on it. So let's, let's gain a competitive advantage over other people by within competition. I'm, I'm going to mess with the game as the coach. I'm going to change the score. I'm going to, I might switch the teams mid game. I'm going to make some bad calls as a referee. I'm going to do things intentionally during competition. We're already emotionally charged to make you upset, to make you frustrated. And then we're going to work on how you deal with that. We're going to work on how you handle those emotions. And it doesn't always go well. You know, it definitely, some guys have full on meltdowns. And to me, those are, excellent learning opportunities because I, I want that to happen at three 30, you know, when there's nobody around and not at seven o'clock when the lights are on and it actually matters for the team, whether we win or lose. And so that, that was kind of a, a interesting and unique part of what we did in development was the, was putting them in the position to move on to the next play when they don't want to. Yeah. It's easy when everybody's in a good mood, and, you know, you, you're, you are emotionally stable, but how do you work on those things when you're, when you're not emotionally stable? Uh, and, and so that's, that's something we worked on physically, but we also, we also worked on it mentally too, because it's something that you can really do from your couch as well. You can sit there and, and just close your eyes and breathe and visualize getting cut off in traffic. And I know that makes my heart rate increase and that makes my, my fist ball up and my shoulders, you know, hook into my ears. and then. I say, okay, notice to myself, notice what your physical body is doing when you're react, when you're just, just imagining it, you know, it's the power of your mind and visualization. You're able to experience these things without even having to go through them. And then you're able to say, okay, when this happens, look, all I care about is getting safely to my destination. I'm not in a competition with this guy that just cut me off. Let me take a deep breath and let me just move on to the next play. And so those, those are the things that, I mean, it's benefited me because I'm sitting there doing these exercises with my players. And, you know, that's a real life application that I think these things have residual benefits, not just in basketball. And that's what I tell these players too, is that this is something that's going to help you communicate with your spouse better. It's going to help make you a better father and teammate. You're just going to, you're going to be more 
present and you're going to listen better because you're going to be listening to yourself and what, what you're doing as well. So those are some of the those are some of the kind of interesting ways that we've been able to, to target some of these skills. Hey, coach, a quick interruption from this episode for a mention from our supporters who, without them, this podcast would not be possible. By using the links I mentioned in these advertisements, it enables me to continue providing this podcast for free for you. The wait is finally over. Football is in full effect, with many teams strutting their stuff. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at Bet Online. Bet Online is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. From game spreads and totals to team, player, and coaching props, Bet Online gives you more options to wager than any place online. Head to Bet Online today and use promo code ARMCHAIR, that's ARMCHAIR in all capitals, to take advantage of all the great sign up bonuses. Bet Online, your online sports book experts. Love it. We used to call them no mistake days, and that would be on the practice plan. I'd write beside a player's name just this is a no mistake day for them. Basically, anytime they made a mistake, we were going to get on them. So we challenged their coping strategies. And, uh, you know, I wasn't great at it. I would have loved to have integration of a sports psychologist, integration of a full time assistant that could have helped monitor and cue them. But I just love these conversations because I think, again, it is the next level of player development is to be able to combine these things. We also talked briefly off uh, air before we started about the fact that a lot of these things aren't being used. Like even at the NBA level, we're on the cutting edge of everything, but the way that we teach the game hasn't changed that much. And you mentioned constraints, and I'd like to dive deeper with that because you gave some great examples. So can you just give us a little bit of perspective on say one workout with a player? Because usually it comes back to me saying, well, how do you use constraints with a player development workout? Can you give us some examples of some of the things that you do to shape their learning? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think to me, constraints are the, you know, it's the gold standard for me. I'm, I'm, I hope that my work is done by the time that the workout starts. I'm there to definitely give feedback and, and help guide and adapt if necessary. But I've changed my philosophy from my work starts when I show up on the court and I got to, you know, get a good hour, 90 minutes worth of work in with this player to before I show up, I have to have the structure in place that allows him to learn on his own. And so I just want to create kind of the the, the structure and let him kind of falter and, and learn for himself within that within those things. So with that being said, yeah, the, the constraints for, you know, just using the most recent example, you know, we had a, a bunch of young players in New Orleans, all with different development goals. And so taking the time to identify what is it that we really want to help boost for this player and what's the constraint that will help them achieve it and then let them go and let them figure out how to utilize it. And so what we, one of the ways we would structure workouts, our player development is we would take about 10 minutes and everybody would kind of have an individual, maybe two guys at a basket to try and get warmed up to target a specific skill. So, you know, it might have been fishing for Lonzo. It might have been, you know, shooting for Brandon Ingram. It might have been uh, some type of defensive or defensive rebounding for Julio Okafor. So those three guys might be on different rims working on a specific skill just to kind of get warmed up, get a little sweat going. And then we bring those guys together. And then in a three-on-three or four-on-four setting, we would say, okay, this first game we're going to play to 11. This is a Brandon Ingram game. You know, Brandon, we're really trying to help you understand ways to score quick, more quickly. We don't want you holding the ball. We don't want you depending on scoring off the dribble. We, there's so many different ways you can score, moving without the ball, cutting to the basket, crashing the offensive glass. And so we'll say the first game, yeah, Lonzo and Jaleel, you're part of this game. You can score too, but we're, the point of this game is to get Brandon shots without the dribble. And so... Jaleel, Zalonso, you guys have no constraints, but the only your team can score is that Brandon scores without the dribble. And so now it's within the team. because Now even his teammates are, are starting to look for how are we going to use Brandon in this different way? How are we going to help him see these different ways that he can see the game? 
And then, so we play to 11 twos and threes against coaches playing defense. We have the realist sticks in our hands and we're, you know, showing them disproportionate length. We want desirable difficulty, you know? And so the coaches, sometimes we're forced into action to have to kind of provide the reads and the looks. And, you know, some of us aren't very realistic defenders when it comes to what they're going to be facing in the NBA. So, you know, we have these sticks that give us these eight foot wingspans so that we can be in passing lanes, deflecting passes, poking at the ball, making them have ball security. And, and even in those things, to me, those develop passing and dribbling better than anything in a, in a block setting. Is this is the most realistic way to practice passing is do it against unrealistic length. Then it'll be easy when you're going against Andre Godala and, you know, Bam and all these guys that have seven foot wingspans. Well, you, you pass against an eight foot wingspan. So the practice is going to be harder than the game. Um, and so we'll play games to 11. If we get, if they, if we get a stop, we get two. If they make it, they get two. Game to 11. We may play one game for Brandon. Then we may say, okay, this next game, uh, we're going to start with Lonzo with the ball. The only constraint is Lonzo has to get two feet in the paint before your team can score. And now, you know, I'm not saying, hey, you have to work on this left to right crossover, anything. Figure it out. You figure out the way that you can get into the paint because we want to work on you driving, being aggressive, making reads, seeing ahead of plays, attacking on the catch, dribbling downhill, drawing the defense, being more aggressive. And, you know, I don't have to say any of those things. I just say, this is the rules to the game. And all of those things are achieved. Um, you know, and Jaleel, we may start, it may be starting with a defensive rebound. And then we're going to flow down into an offensive possession. Jaleel gets a touch. He can't score on the post touch. You know, he you can only score off a, a assisted basket by Jaleel. So now we're putting Jaleel in the post, in pick and roll. But now he, he can't score. So now he's forced to kind of look at the game in a different way. So those are kind of just, you know, those are three little examples. That would be, that'd be a day, you know, we might, that's a 45 minute workout um, in terms of those guys doing individual coming together, constraint games. And then we'd all meet as a staff and kind of say, okay, what worked, what didn't work and how can we, how can we adjust these constraints to, you know, better target the things we're working on or target something else. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. It, it definitely answers and gives people a really in-depth perspective on it. And, uh, you know, constraints are the things that shape learning. And people are always somewhat unsure of what I mean by we can teach the game while they play the game if we use intelligent practice design around constraints particularly. Yeah. And so, but so to me, I only consider individual, like to me, if, an, if I was working out a player individually, I would want. I would need four players on the court. I would need an, I would need two offense and two defense. And, and I mean, I think that the ideal individual work situation, which is it's crazy how many resources you need to create the ideal. Um, it actually kind of reminds me, I was just out in LA for two weeks um, working with Noah LaRoche and he's got all these Hall of Fame players in the gym. And it's crazy because almost nothing that he does doesn't at least have the option of a coach that you can pass to. So he's got this army of interns and he literally can toggle between four on four, three on three, two on two. He does go to some one-on-ones as well, but even the way he starts, it's all two on two, but three of the players are coaches. And so, and I, I love that because, you know, sometimes I've gotten some, some feedback about, well, you know, players should be playing against players and with players and not, you know, what is the benefit of having the coach out there? But when you have everyone on the court that's dedicated to achieving the objectives of one person's skill development, and you can create these different situations to me, that was so next level to watch him go, okay, it's four on four, this possession, we're doing TV 12 reads out of a pick and roll. And so he's coming off pick and roll. Then the next possession, it's, Two on two, you don't have a dribble. Coach starts with the ball. And now the coach is driving, and now the players have to shift into, okay, I have to relocate. I have to find a way. Now I don't have a dribble. I have to see the game to get my shot. And then, okay, now we're back in three on three with an advantage. And now, again, I have to, okay. Um, and so it's just I think those are – I love I love that setup. And I do think that that's, that's a, a – much more efficient way of training a player from scratch 
I just love, I, I can't remember, and I'll send you the article. I read this, this blog and it was like years ago. And he said in it that true shooting practice always involves a decision. And so to me, yeah, there is the decision in one-on-one of, am I going to shoot right away on a closeout or drive or dribble? But even if it's just, if I drive and that guy stays home, I know I have a one-on-one finish versus if that guy comes and helps, I have this pass that I can make. I, I love that layer of it because it is a team game and there is, and I think there's never the, and this is, go, I'm going on a little bit of a, a tangent here, but it's how much, how many players shoot better in one-on-one versus any time you add teammates on the court. And I think there is a psychological element to that because I know it's for me personally, if I know, okay, it's one-on-one, I'm shooting this every time. There's no, this is the best shot for the team. I'm going to shoot it. You, you shoot the ball better when you have other players on the court. And now the thought comes in, okay, is this the right shot to take for the team? Again, that adds another level of cognitive load that exists in the game. Not for all players. You got some players that really don't, that never factors into their decision making. But I think for a lot of players, the decision to take the shot is, is a, is an important one that, that should be included as well. But, but theoretically, I think you're definitely on the right track. So, so many, again, so many things to unpack there, which is, which is just brilliant because it's exactly the conversation. And, and from my perspective, I'm a hundred percent on board with what you said about nose workouts and what you're, what you're saying there. What I was trying to get at is this concept of skipping the on air that coaches feel they need to do and skipping the block practice, which coaches feel they need to do. How can a learner learn without getting so good at the skill before we put them in the game? And the point is they can learn through constraints, which yeah. is great. Uh, the, the other thing that uh, I just want to bring out with this is this concept, which you've said a few times, this mindless block practice. Because again, no matter how many times I shout it, people don't quite get it. But what you said from the beginning and what you just said there is that without decisions, players become mindless in their skill applications Because essentially, especially if they shoot from the same spot, after the first few reps, they don't have to think again because they know the distance, they know the arc, they know the power, and they don't have to think about anything else, a teammate or a defender. And that's really what you're getting at here is that that is really limited. But I'm imagining at the NBA player, you still have to do a lot of that because that's what they're used to. 100%. That's what, I mean, it's the comfort level, it's familiarity. Um, And it's also, I think, it's easy. It's, it's mindless. Like, I mean, like you just said, it's, it's easy to get those reps up. I mean, and to your point, there's a, you know, there's, it's just like shooting free throws, you know, you shoot a hundred free throws and we've seen that, you know, that's a big thing. Coaches say, Hey, we, we missed a bunch of free throws after practice, everybody make a hundred free throws. And I mean, even if guys do stick to the two and rotate, which they don't, you know, guys are going to shoot 10 in a row and it's, to your point, it's shooting the free, first free throw once, the second one nine straight times, and it's and guys shoot no co- them great in practice. Yeah, you know? no correlation between free throw practice in a blocked manner and game free throw percentage. And, and free throws, in fairness, for like a lot of basketball stuff hasn't been studied, but free throws have been studied. And definitely people should be beyond that because there's tons of evidence that suggests exactly what you're saying. That essentially is a waste of time for a player. So can you talk about some different ways to do it? Yeah. Well, one, we play so many games that free throws happen all the time. I call fouls all the time in workouts. Anytime in a workout you get whacked with a stick or any foul, we're going to put you on the line, make you make two for the point. I mean, we're going to create pressure situations where you got to make two with 10 seconds left when you're up by two, and it's going to either make it a one-possession game or a two-possession game. You know, I think those are – dealing with pressure, I think, is – that's where people fail the most. And that's where this block practice and these external cues and these, you know, do this mechanically. This is the evidence says this is why people choke. This is why when pressure comes in, you're relying on this voice, this voice that's been telling you, oh, put your, tuck your elbow in and, and do, make sure your to- 10 toes are pointed at the rim. And I mean, these things are proven to impair performance but that's not stopping anyone from using them because there's a, the, f- the feedback loop is 
it's a big time endorphin hit. Your ego gets stroked every time you say, it, shoot the ball a little, get your elbow up a little bit higher. And then the next shot goes in. As a coach, you feel like, yeah, I just helped that guy big time right there. That was me. And as a player, you actually have the same conversations. That's the interesting part is we have this inner dialogue too, which comes from the inner game of tennis. And it's, you say, you have self one telling yourself, Hey, you got to make this shot, man. Like we got to do this. And then if it works, you, you get that pat on your back. I did that. I told myself I was going to do that instead of just letting yourself do it, which you're perfectly able to do. A lot of these guys can throw the ball into the rim from 15 feet from 25 feet from wherever they can do it physically. It's a matter of, do they allow themselves to do it or do they want some type of little ego boost in telling themselves to do it? And you know, the evidence suggests that doing it, doing it the way of the, of the external cues and that, you know, self one talking to yourself, that really impairs performance when the pressure's on and you got that voice saying, oh, now, now you're in trouble. Instead of just having rehearsed in this way of, I know what to do. I've been in these situations. I'm just going to let my body new, do what it's already trained to do. Um, and so, yeah, I think all those things kind of, I, I didn't, I'm going into some some different things about the free throws, but that's that's how I teach free throw shooting. One is identifying your routine because guys oftentimes, even at the professional level, don't have one. You know, they don't know what they do. Just bringing awareness to that. Hey, let's just let's build a routine and stick to it. And and you can change it. You know, JJ Redick changed his routine multiple times during a season to keep it fresh. Guy shoots ninety percent. So I'm not saying that it's like a immutable. You have to do the same thing every time, but have a game plan because that's something to think about besides, you know, the fact that oftentimes there's 20,000 people in an arena looking at you all at once when a free throw comes. Um, so yeah, just trying to recreate real situations where you're going to the free throw line to make two. If you make two, you get the point. If you don't, you don't get the point. And also creating pressure situations where it's, uh, the stakes are a little bit higher because it's easy to, it's easy to walk, walk along a balance beam when it's on the ground, but when it goes up to about, you know, 2000 feet, uh, people walk on the, on the beam a whole lot differently. And so it's, it's trying to create that little sense of in a low stakes environment, some of those different situations. Did you, did you ask JJ why he actually changed his routine? Cause I think that's brilliant because again, it's keeping it fresh, as you said, but did, did he explain it to you? Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah. He said, yeah, I, I want to, I like to do it. So it gives me something else to lock in on. Oh yeah, that's right. I've added this shimmy, you know, at the end of my routine now. Um, yeah. Because a routine can become complacent, right? right? Like that's, that's brilliant. I love that. He changes that, yeah, you know, and can uh, become a rut. yes. Yeah. That's tremendous. Hey, another thing, like just a great thing that you said earlier, and I want to come back to you, you talked about adding cognitive load when someone's shooting and saying, listen, only the back rim counts. So I had a skill acquisition motor learning professor talk to me once about what shooting perfection actually is. And they brought it to my attention, which I thought was brilliant, that actually learning how to miss in a spot, say left rim, would lead to more shooting improvement than trying to make clean swishes. And it's exactly what you just said there is that it just heightens the cognitive load and concentration. And I don't want to skip past it because I thought it was a tremendous thing. Can you talk about your experience in using some of those ideas? Absolutely. I totally agree with it. It's, I mean, it's so, and, and like you were saying, a lot of these guys are going to want to shoot spots. So I'll say, okay, uh, your first spot is with your heels on the three point line. Your next shot is two feet behind the three point line. So we're going to work on your, you know, motor control. You know, yeah, I, I don't want you shooting mid range shots in the game for this reason, because up until the very end of the game or the end of the shot clock, we can get a much more probable point points for this. We can get higher efficiency than this dribble pull up that you're taking. So that's why I don't want you to shoot mid range in the game strategically. But as far as motor control, yeah, we're going to shoot mid range. Yeah, we're going to shoot deep threes. We're going to shoot from all over the floor. And, and I mean, even working on free throws, uh, you know, during during the uh, the quarantine, when we were getting guys back, working guys one on oh, I wouldn't even let guys shoot from the free throw line. I, I made them shoot 
a step in and a step behind the free throw line. Again, motor control, and it goes back to the exper experiment about tossing the bean bags, where they said that one control group only did uh, near and far tosses, and the other one only practiced at the competition line. I think it was like a 15 foot toss, and one group only practiced at 12 and 18 feet, and one group only practiced at 15. And then when they came together and they and they the group that practiced at 12 and 18 never practiced at the competition distance, they crushed the other control group. And so I just think, why wouldn't I apply that to my free throw practice or any other practice? I just want to stop you because, again, brilliant things you're bringing out there uh, about that variability. The reason is, according to the research, is because we avoid that mindlessness where they have to think on each repetition. And what thinking does is it cues this retrieval process where I have to retrieve information about a prior rep. And then retrieval process leads to this retention process, which means it leads to this permanence. And it means that they learned it better. And that learning obviously leads to that. The other quick thing I want to throw in there, I don't know if this is true, but somebody told me once that Larry Bird did this that he never shot free throws from the free throw line, exactly like you said. And he'd work his way progressively back to the three-point line with his free throw routine. Because again, that same application of what you just said. Brilliant stuff. Sorry to interrupt, but keep going. Oh, with this. Yeah, yeah, Jerry. Bird, I would definitely believe Bird would do it based on the way he shot it, for sure. And I mean, you look at Bird too, it's funny because he's a guy at the free throw line that's not holding his follow through. It's like, there's so many of these things that you know, we're, we're constantly hearing in the gym, hold your follow through. And I mean, I charted it because I want to help players get better. So I thought, it's oh, I, I've said this for so long. Is there anything to it? And then I went and charted at all the makes of the players that I worked with. And when they held their follow through, they were not more likely to make it. In fact, when they shot it and they knew it was going in, they almost never held their follow through. Once the ball was gone and you knew it was going in, there was no reason at that point to hold your follow through. So I just was like, is this an identifying factor of a good mechanics? I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think it is. And so it's just an interesting thing, like the 10 toes to the rim and the holding yeah. your follow through and these like these established coaching cues that when I actually watch or don't cross your feet on defenses of all these things, then I just watch the best defenders and the best shooters in the world constantly do the opposite all the time when it's time to compete. And I just, we just haven't we haven't caught up to to teaching teaching the actual what we're seeing on the court. It's still a lot of what we heard when we were when we were growing up. We still hang on to these historical and cultural norms about how to coach basketball for sure. And the other part you just added there, which is so important: watch your players. If you want to know how to teach a closeout, if you want to know how to teach something, watch your best players because they've learned it through experiential practice, right? right? Like they've developed these habits despite us often, right? We're trying to change them and they just despite it. The only thing I want to add about the follow through, we're not saying for young players because for young players, the habit of holding the free throw leads to the ha a habit over time of them not holding their free throw. But you might have to start from that point of holding it so that they understand the basic biomechanical movement. Right, absolutely. You want the same shot every time. That's the consistency of the shot is key. And if you can do the same thing every time strictly, that allows you the freedom, like improv comics. You have to be trained in a way that's very almost stifling. And then once you're able to embody these things, then the freedom comes. Then you're able to shoot at different angles, different release points, different follow throughs, of course. So, yeah, I, I agree. There's, there's different rules depending on your experience level. I love that you brought up improv comics. I don't think there's a better, I guess, person to study than someone that's done improv. Because again, the whole learning process, they go through this failure, the struggle, the desirable difficulties, the figuring it out, right? All these different things are such a parallel to how you should learn basketball. Right. Yeah. We, we talk about the improv comics and Navy SEALs all the time. I'm always mm -hmm. telling players... I want you to be Navy SEALs. I want you to be able to drop into any situation, playing for any coach in any role and be able to be successful. How can I do that? I have to be able to create robust, resilient problem solvers. And so how can I create those people in drills where I'm telling you what to do the whole time? You drive here and pass here and go back out here and he passes back to you and then say, 
oh, that pass won't be there. That that will get deflected. But there's no one out there. Uh, why not put someone out there and actually show them that it'll get deflected? That's how you learn because people learn by doing, not by listening. All the things you're telling them are great. And even the best intention, you know, most respectful kids, they just, that's that's not really the way that they learn. It's, it's going to take a long time of just saying things. You learn much quicker by doing. Love it. Couldn't agree more. Uh, going back to something else you talked about uh, just quickly. So we hit on it. Uh, um, the the rate of perceived exertion, uh, you know, the traditional scale, I don't know if you used it, the Borg scale, which is basically a six out of 20, right? Uh, can you just explain a little bit how a coach could apply this concept? I don't know if you use that scale or a different one, but just give them perspective on that. Yeah. So, I mean, all of kind of every feedback is, has its flaws, has its limitations. One of the most consistent and reliable ones is how do you feel? I mean, as crazy as it sounds, it's simple, but asking a player, you know, before and after, how do you feel today? I feel good. I'm ready to go. Okay, cool. Then we're ready to go. Or, mm, uh, you know, if you have a good trust with them and they can tell you, I don't have it today, you know, you can adapt your practice plan because we know if you don't have a, if you didn't sleep the night before or you're stressed out, or you're in some emotional state, you're not going to learn anyways. Those are, those are like, those are precursors. We got to have those out of the way before we can really get into learning. And so, you know, that's, uh, there's a great book uh, called NeuroTeach that really talks about a lot of those things about how, how learning really happens. And it's, uh, so you got to have, you got to have guys in the right frame of mind to accept information. Otherwise, you're just kind of breaking a sweat, which is fine too, but that should be then the intention of the session that you're doing. And then, you know, we use it because we didn't, it depends on the level of sports science involvement you have. Sometimes these teams will have guys where the, the sports scientists are very, you know, they, like when I was in Memphis, those guys would tell me, hey, look, very specifically, this guy needs for a red, yellow, or green day today based on what his, what his data is. And a lot of the information you get, some of some of the uh, <clears throat> some of the um, feedback from the players after how did, how did that session go? Oh, that was a you know we'd ask them on a scale of one to ten, and that was an eight out of ten for me. You like, wow, that was intense. And you may not think that as a as a coach, you may think oh, I thought that was I didn't think that was I pushed them that hard. But what you think doesn't really matter. What you really have to do is be open minded to listening to what these guys are saying because it's the most accurate description of how difficult your session was. Tremendous. So, you know, sometimes the simplest things are the ones that can make the most impact. And, uh, you know, we've talked about that throughout here as well in terms of practice design. And uh, I want to get into just again, a little bit more detail about some of these things. And let's start with on court stress tests. Can you talk about the ways that you implement them in terms of practice design? Sure. So, yeah, I mean, what we play games, uh, like I said, I keep coming back to it. I mean, I, it's, I want you to keep coming back to it. (laughs) Yeah. It seems simple. It seems simple, but it's hard work. You got to come up with good ones and then you have to be able to, you know, adapt them on the fly. But, um, yeah, we try and create pressure situations as much as possible. Um, and we want to have, uh, we want to have your emotions up. So we're going to, I mean, what, I, what I tend to do is, you know, I'll talk a little trash and I'll make some bad calls. That's really, it's, it's pretty simple to get under an NBA player's skin. Just make him feel like he's getting screwed by the refs that really, they don't like that, let alone not a real ref, but some coach out there that they know is messing with the game. And they know that the purpose is to get under their skin, but you know, once you're playing and your adrenaline's pumping, guys want to win. There's a reason they're playing in the NBA. They want to win everything. And so they come, all you have to do is create a competitive environment. And then it's so easy to tweak it so that you can basically make a person frustrated. And now, or, or even just, hey, look, in this game, you're going against the coaches and you're down by eight points. And we're putting three minutes on the court, three minutes on the clock. It's Loser's ball. We're playing in the half court. 
And your guys' constraint is you can only score on assisted baskets. That's it. You guys can play however you want to play, but you can only score on assisted baskets. And now I've added a little cognitive load. I've added a constraint. They're down by a certain amount of points. And now they are they want to win. They want to beat the coaches. They don't want to hear us talk trash. So now they're trying to work together. They're trying to game plan, figure out, all right, this is what we're going to do. Then the game starts. So we're playing. The clock's ticking. And then I make a bad call. Oh, that's a, that's traveling. And now – now they're even more mad because they were coming back. It was a three-point game, and they had the ball, and now it's an unfair call. And then I'll just bring awareness to it. I'll bring awareness to what's going on. And then, again, hopefully they make the game close, and now we can execute what are you going to do when you're down by three with 13 seconds left? What do you do? I'm not going to tell you. Do you want to follow us and put us on the line? You know, okay, now you, you – and then they get into it. Oh, do I have a timeout? Do we have a timeout? And then, you know, you give them a clipboard. Here you go. What are you guys going to run? And now, it, and again, we really try and empower the players as teachers too, as much as possible, asking them questions, trying to get them engaged and involved in what's going on. If you can have a player teach another player something that you've already worked on, to me, that's like the ultimate win because now not only is he learning and probably more receptive to the message, but the player teaching it, it just encoded that so much more deeply into him. Teaching is one of the best ways of learning. And so, yeah, then, we, you know, it's a three-point game. Now they're on the board. Okay, this is what we're going to do. Then maybe we take a foul. We foul up three. Now we're sending to the free throw. Line. We're working on free throw practice under pressure. We're telling them, if you miss this, the game's over. Then they got to make pr- free throws under pressure. They get the ball back. Now they, you know, we give a guy an opportunity to make a game-winning shot. Um, and so things like that, just trying to make – it's just like low-stakes texting. Like a big thing for us is just test. You got to test. You got to test all the time because – that gives you information as the coach on where they are. It's just a way of measuring, okay, have they learned this? Or where, where are we? Where are we constantly trying to refine and adapt what we're teaching and how we're teaching? And then the test, then if you do it enough, then no longer do you have any anxiety about a test. It's like, oh, it's just another one of these quizzes. No big deal. You know, it's, and it's, and it is no, you have to create an environment where it is no big deal. That if you do fail, it's okay. If you do get something wrong, that's fine. The mistakes are the first step to learning. That that has to happen, you know. And even if, you know, and with testing, even if you get it wrong, when you get the right answer, it's encoded much more deeply just by guessing. It's like called generation. You you try and come up with an answer, even if it's wrong. Then when you get the right answer, it's just a more deep uh, connection to your memory. And so, you know, using our memory shapes our memory. And so, just trying to give them experiences of pressure situations, recreate them as much as possible. You know, we played, we played competitively basically before every single game, all 82 games. If you didn't play a lot of minutes and we played it, we played at four o'clock before the game or, or if we couldn't, then it was the next day, you know, in the practice facility, we put on the pennies, you know, we, we, we made, I made box scores and I'd make highlight videos and, and uh, just trying to make it fun and make it, Make it an experience that, you know, goes into this Rolodex of memories where you can draw on them. And when these situations come up in real life, it's uh, it's old hat. You've been there. You've done that. You've been successful and you failed. And so it's just you're, you're better able to handle the moment. Hey, coach, a quick interruption from this episode for a mention from our supporters who, without them, this podcast would not be possible. By using the links I mentioned in these advertisements, it enables me to continue providing this podcast for free for you. The wait is finally over. Football is in full effect, with many teams strutting their stuff. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at Bet Online. Bet Online is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. From game spreads and totals to team, player, and coaching props, Bet Online gives you more options to wager than any place online. Head to Bet Online today and use promo code ARMCHAIR, that's ARMCHAIR in all capitals, to take advantage of all the great sign-up bonuses. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. Listen up, fellows, because today we have a new Manscaped product alert. Manscaped just released the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. Take a look in the mirror and I guarantee you'll see hair sticking out of those holes. It's time to keep your ear and nose hair looking as nice as your clean-shaven pubes. Manscaped is forever changing the grooming game with their Weed Whacker. The nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary skin-safe technology, which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate holes. 
the premium Manscaped Weed Whacker uses a 9,000 RPM motor-powered, 360-degree rotary dual-blade system. Its intelligently contoured design enhances the trimming experience, and it is waterproof, which makes for easy operation and cleaning. Look, fellas, 79% of partners polled admitted that long nose hair is a major turnoff. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code armchair at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code armchair. What are you waiting for? Go back your weed. Thank you, Manscaped, for keeping our pubes trimmed and hairs in our holes looking nice. Now back to the podcast. And when you're talking about this, we're, we're not talking about, you know, three on three or one on one where you just check the ball. You're talking about dynamic or situational starts, I assume. Can you talk about that? Yeah, exactly. I think to, to the point of rolling the balls out, there's, there's a conditioning element to playing with no constraints and no cognitive load. And, you know, the guys are going to run up and down. Some people will do it more than others. Um, you know, that's part of basketball that we also overlook is sometimes these drills and the way the games are created and the way teams play is much more, you know, exert exerting than for some players than others. So being mindful of that, trying to, if you just let players to their own, own devices, they're going to oftentimes fall into their comfort level. You know, we, we, we definitely don't rise to the occasion. We fall to the level of our training. And I think that, you know, it's, I, I'm, there is a place for it for sure. And guys love to do that too. Guys just want to play pickup without, you know, just to play. And that's, that's one, you just have to have a, a an objective that that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to give them a, a rest mentally and you're going to break a sweat and get some physical exertion out of it. But yeah, as far as what, what we do in terms of development, yeah, my whole job is to come up with the constraints and the situation that's going to target um, the things that I, I'm trying to improve with each player. So, yeah, creating the, the game situations, the different the different situations, different constraints, and then the the, the curveballs too. Because even when I say it's going to be one way, I could change it, and you have to be willing and able to stay present and still be competitive and still win despite you know things that are that are out of the ordinary. Because that that's going to happen. That's the game and that's life. So for me, again, it comes back to the simplicity of this in a lot of ways is, and I know we don't do this, but you could essentially do the same thing every day, like say play three on three. But within that, you could change so many variables that make it seem like a completely different drill, right? The dynamic start. Okay. Today we're going to start from a, uh, you know, a, a toss to a wing. And it's going to be a live start off that a situational start. Well, today we're going to start from a wing ball screen. Tomorrow we're going to start from a slot ball screen. Well, and then even more so all the things that you've talked about already, you can manipulate the constraints. This has to happen before this can happen. That type of mindset. It's just tremendous what you can do with practice design. If you understand how to use these things. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, an advantage. It's at an advantage to start. Now, there's no advantage. You have to create the advantage. There's all these different ways you can start. We're starting, uh, everybody's at half court, so we're flowing into a semi-transition. Oh, we're starting with the corners filled. You know, it's more of a half court possession. There's definitely all these different ways that you can manipulate it. And because there's you're keeping score and because there's these, this dynamic element, to your point, it's it is engaging. The hour flies by when you're doing this. These guys want to come back. They're excited to be in the gym in the morning. Guys love to play basketball. And it's if you but if you if you just leave them to their own devices, this the standard is getting in and shooting a bunch of repetitions over and over and over again. That's the mo that's the mental model players have of what improvement looks like. And so it is up to the coach to create the environment because the other thing that it does is it saves so much time to your point from before. There's so much time wasted on these siloing, these, these, these micro skills of, okay, we have to spend time on this. We have to spend time on that. We have to spend, instead of saying, no, we're not going to spend time on any of that stuff. We're going to address all of it in a super fun, dynamic, efficient period of time. And then to 
uh, then I think the next frontier after you're able to get to that, and I know I'm getting ahead of myself because we haven't even got there yet, but it's take some of that time that you're saving from your spot up shooting and go sit and do some virtual reality, do some mental sit and breathe, do some meditation and work on some emotional control or some whatever focus breathing or eye movements or any of the things you could do from, you know, the chair where you have your Norma text on and you're recovering or you're on the table getting the Theragun and you're recovering. And let's, let's add some development to where you're not physically taxing yourself so we can optimize the time that we have you on your feet. Because to me, one of the biggest misnomers is that when people say, well, there's not enough time. We don't have time to practice in the NBA. There's not enough time. These guys don't have time. And it just, that's not been my experience. Guys make time for what they want to do, especially guys that are, you know, gym rats. They're in the gym shooting for hours a day. I mean, Brandon Ingram and Lonzo Ball shoot for two hours a day, every single day. And that's just part of their routine. And that's in addition to what they do in practice. And so, you know, if, if it's not a matter of these guys not being able or willing to work hard, I think it's really a matter of, the coaches optimizing the time that they're spending on the court. Absolutely. Well, I love that. I love you. I love you sharing these examples from the NBA. And again, it's often the case where we feel like certain players, they don't want to do this, but you talked about engagement and you said time goes faster. Well, time goes faster because they are engaged in what they're doing because of these things that are stimulating their mind, right? When time goes slow, it's because it's literally what? It's mindless. That's when time goes slow. When you're engaged, it goes faster. So can you talk to me about enjoyment and engagement? Yeah, I, I, I just read this great book and, you know, he says, you don't coach a sport, you coach a player. and I think that it's, it's, you have to meet the player where they are and we don't do that enough. We, we rely on our own expertise and some of the stuff you, you know, I've done with some players is great. I think it's awesome. I am really proud of myself, but it may not be where the next guy I'm working with, where he, where he is. And, you know, learning is done by scaffolding off of existing expertise basically it's what you're good at you you build off of that and so f- basically just treating every player as an individual and coming to them and, and developing a plan that works best for them that meets them where they are that identifies and understands what their level of understanding of the concepts are of what their execution of skills are and then building off that i worked with this coach darnell lazar he used to always talk about you know, when you're driving, first, you got to drive around the parking lot before you get on the expressway. And so, you know, we got to find you got to find ways to meet the player where they are, develop them where they are and get them into the, the point that they're able to um, to do more messy, dynamic learning. Um, and not everybody may be there at the same place and at the same spot. But um, when you when you really listen to the players and you try and meet them where they are then I think that that builds a lot of trust and buy-in from the players where they're, they're able to see, okay, this, this guy is really listening to me. He's really trying to help me. And so that once you're able to build that trust, then you can start to kind of guide them into the situations that you think are the best for their learning. And then they kind of have to, you know, take a leap of faith based on your, their relationship with you. And then when they do it, you see, and this is like when I was a kid, like, this is fun, you know, and, and that's what the game is all about, I think, you know, and we, you know, we, we come up with fun ways to do it. Like, we'll some days we'll be real loud in the gym when the players come in and we'll say, no players win today. There's no players going to win today. And then we get the sticks, you know, we have these, these sticks that give us these long wingspans and we just are menaces. We're poking out every ball. We're deflecting every pass. We're blocking every shot. And we really try to not let them win at all in any of the constraints games. And then we brag and we talk, we go into the training room and say, yeah, you know, Zion lost his game today. Zion couldn't beat us today. And so we get, you know, and then 
it's fun. It's just trash talk. And, you know, it's, it's, it's unrealistic. Yeah. They get mad because, you know, it's like shots that would never get blocked or getting blocked and passes that would never get deflected again. That's we say, well, too bad. You guys are NBA players. I'm five eleven. figure it out. And, you know, it's just, it's really just creating the fun. It's, it's having fun too. You know, if you're in there and it's, it's super, you know, we got to take this super serious. Then I think it's a little bit harder, but you know, we're having fun too. Believe me. It's, uh, you know, when we make them guard us and if we make a shot, oh man, I got a, I got a highlight tape I can send you that, uh, you know, these guys, these guys don't want coming out on the internet and me making shots on guys. And, you know, I put some music behind it. And so, yeah, that, it's the engagement is, is it's about finding, you know, what makes every player tick and you, you just, there's buttons for every player and you just got to find them. And, and all you got to do is, is ask some questions and listen to them and they'll tell you for the most part. And, and if you're able to, if you're able and willing to adapt to, you know, different people for different situations, then I think it's, it's really easy to get engagement when you're playing games because everybody likes to play. Everybody likes to compete. And, and at this level, you know, these guys want to win. It's something that keeps them coming back. And if, after those days where they lose, oh, they're itching to get back on the court the next day. They can't wait to get us back. And, uh, and then they usually do. And so that's kind of a, that's kind of the back and forth we play is, you know, is, you know, sometimes making it more challenging, even to an unrealistic uh, extent, just to give them that challenge. Cause that's, that's the thing. These guys are, these guys are the best of the best. And if you don't challenge them, it, it, it gets mundane. Tremendous. And I, I don't want coaches to just think this is the NBA level. This is something that we should be doing at all levels of basketball a lot more and that using a lot of the things that you've talked about, about practice design, not necessarily the trash talking part of it, but everything else <laughs> applies to all levels because there's two parts to that. One, players love to be engaged. They love to know that they're improving. And two, they love competition. And if they don't love competition, we have to teach them how to love competition. So score and these different things, like I am a big believer in we should teach them how to lose. We should teach them how to win. And the only way to do that is to compete at almost everything we do. And, uh, you know, that's, that's gotta be a part of this, right? Yeah, absolutely. I love that. It's so true. It's so true. You gotta, anything we focus concentration to your point earlier, those things can be trained. You can't just, it's too easy as a coach to say, whatever, he's a dumb player or he's lazy or he doesn't, you know, he's all these things that we, like they're finished products, like these 19, 20, 21, 25, 27 year old people are, that's it. They, they, they can't improve. Well, I'm not saying that they can or can't, but unless we've addressed it and tried to develop it, I don't think we should say that this is their final form. And so, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Totally agree. It's great stuff. And uh, one last thing uh, we could talk forever, but one last thing might be, these conversations that you have to have with players to explain your methods, because again, this is foreign to them. It's the same thing. I'm having conversations with so many coaches. They don't quite get some of these methods. It, I think it intuitively makes sense, but you have to explain it. Can you talk about that process? Yeah, that's, that's key. That's a great point by you. I think there's, I mean, there's such a kind of, stigma when you talk about analytics players that you have to you do have to sit down and explain what effective field goal percentage is you have to explain to them what a 40 percent three-point shot looks like over 82 games yeah i mean and my experience is it has been for the most part they're extremely receptive and they don't understand the information as well as we give them credit for we think that they know exactly, they know that the, the three is more valuable and more efficient, but they don't care. They're stubborn. They're stuck in their ways. They want to shoot the pull up too. You know, they're going to, that's their game. They're going to do it. And it's, that is their game and they are going to do it, but they oftentimes don't even understand the why behind why these coaches are now telling them we want to take away these dribble twos and get to the rim or kick out to shoot or create more driving kicks so we can get these shots. It's like, why, why are we doing that? And so just, I mean, yeah, that's, you have to visualize the data in, in, in interesting ways, um, in different ways. You know, I have, 
I do shot charts with the adjusted field goal percentage on them. You know, the hot zones. Um, you know, I do the points per possession. Um, you know, you just, I just try and hit them with so many different ways of saying the same information um, from an actual data standpoint. I think that's key. Sending guys just even their cleaning the glass snapshot or their synergy snapshot it says, hey, look, off the dribble, you shoot, you know, you, you're a 0.9 points per possession. Off the catch, you're 1.1. Take with that what you will. This is just information, you know, and down the line, hey, look, on your on your uncontested shots, you shoot 1.3 points per possession. On your contested shots, you're 0.8. You know, so it's it's just the education factor is part of it. And uh, you know, I think that there's yeah, it, it's it's such an interesting not dilemma, but but it is a it is a part of it, is the hey, look we're going to train in a little bit of a different way than you may be used to. And this is why, and you have to have, and I found that anecdotes are usually the most convincing, you know, I, well, you know, they did this study where it was shooting practice and, you know, half of the, half the group shot at a target and the other half were being chased and they had to shoot. They were, they were shooting back while being chased. That's how they learned in their target practice. And guess who shot better in the dynamic exercise when they were testing for the police test. It wasn't the guy standing there shooting against the target because that wasn't realistic for what they were going to be dealing with in the test or out on the street. And so um, I, I can't remember the study. I had it written down. I, I have some stuff I, I need to send you after this. But it's, you know, it's there's anecdotes and information of all these things where you can say, hey, look, this is it's, it's science. <laughs> it's proven. This is evidence based. This isn't something that I'm. I wouldn't be asking you to do something unorthodox if it wasn't based in something that's already been research proven. And then, you know, and then with some of the guys, some of the guys are, are, are super open-minded and want to learn about it. And so, you know, at that point I have, you know, my development book, which is, it's the articles and information that inform my methods that whenever I get a job, I give it to all the people I'm working with. I say, look, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. I didn't make this up. I, I wish I did, but I'm not that smart. I just listen to all these other people that have had, have proven these things. And that's why I'm doing it is because I like for my methods to be based in some type of research and evidence. Um, and so, and yeah, then guys read it, you know, and I'll, it's a lot of times I just text them. I text them stuff all the time too. Um, just, yeah, anything I can, but I think it's it's just like anything else. You got to explain it in ten different ways and find the one way that that makes them go ah ah okay. Uh, and then you just got to keep keep at it too. It's it's a it's a consistency thing too because I know you know I it took me a long time to get it too. So I, I have a I have a have to have some patience with these guys as well. I love it. I mean, it's so many great things uh, throughout. But you, the other part that you you talked about there, which is this this mindset players or of coaches in my example, but look, I get it. You got to where you were in part because you did block practice. So it makes sense that you think that is the most effective way because you got to the NBA or you got to college coaching or you got to wherever. So I get that default, but I just constantly ask is, but don't you want to know if there is a better way? Cause you did it that way. Cause you didn't know anything in terms of there was a better way. And then the other part is, well, you show me the evidence that what you're doing is working because it's really hard to find the evidence that supports block practice or these mindless drills like three-man weave of having any impact on player development. And uh, that's where I counter and say, well, you want me to show you evidence of my stuff? That's fine. I will. Now you show me your evidence that we can kind of have a discussion about. Problem is there isn't any evidence, right? (laughs) Right. That's great stuff. Coach, I can't thank you enough. Just brilliant stuff. And uh, I encourage coaches to, if they get a chance to be able to follow you and reach out to you uh, and continue to connect with you, uh, just tremendous ideas to be able to share the game with us. Thanks for spending time. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and to give the Basketball Podcast and this week's guest a shout out on social media to show your support for us sharing the game. And to stay up to date on all things basketball immersion, subscribe to our newsletter at basketballimmersion.com newsletter.